than what's on the first lecture of the video, but I'll make sure today that I bridge the two together and uh, it should be a little more smoother moving forward. Um, we're talking about how we make metals mostly. I'll also talk about uh, polymers a little bit um, next time. So for me, it's on Thursday. This week I do Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, if we go back to the live lecture from Friday, what I did is I brought in a little bit the introduction and this is how we're going to do this semester a little bit more where I don't want to just teach you how we make parts assembly. I also want you to think about how it goes into the life cycle of a product or a structure. So um, you start, um, a lot of things we built are based on what we've learned from science. And that's why it's called material science and engineering. <laughs> but, um, we didn't do a lot of R&D. Eventually, we want to build something, right? And that's really the, the core of engineering to fulfill a need. And then things do fail. We learn a lot from that. And that's why it was one thing I mentioned Friday. Um, when we um, have a system, we have a building code or we, we have a manufacturing specification that has worked for 20 years making aircrafts a certain way it's very difficult to change that because now you start forgetting, well, why are we making this check or why are we asking for this? And, and that some of that know-how is all blended into the performance history. So things don't fail and you, you do know why, but you don't know all the reasons and therefore making a change is, is a lot more complicated than we'd like to think. Um, and we'll talk about structural integrity, rehabilitation, and that's something that I mentioned a little bit in the, uh, the, um, the video lecture for those that were not here. I'm involved with a startup company, but when we are becoming a company at this point, we have revenues, we test uh, old pipelines, and the, the overall scope is um, bridges, tunnels, airplanes, built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they were, they were all thinking about a certain useful life uh, for that structure. If you, if you built a bridge and uh, like the, the, the Longfellow Bridge, they didn't think a hundred years later it will still be there. <laughs> so all these uh, criteria that they had for, uh, even there was a story about when they built Longfellow Bridge, the Red Line Bridge, there was a train going on, there was a trolley going on it, but there was only five cars in Boston area. So it was all horses and very, very different. They were not putting salts the way that we put salts today to the ice, the roads. So it, it was impossible for them back <clears throat> then to say, okay, I'm going to make this steel structure in a way that it's not going to rust, that the rivets are not going to burst and that everything's going to be fine. So. Uh, the counter side to this is uh, if you've taken the, the duck tour or been around enough, you see these arch structures and the historical people want to preserve that. It would be almost impossible to make it exactly like it is today uh, if it was done using modern manufacturing with big beams and you know, everything much simpler than this intricate structure. So they want to extend the life. Um, and I was part of the, uh, the structural engineering team to evaluate the options. Are we keeping the arch, but destroying this column? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? And at the end of the day, it does boil down to going back to how things were built back then with the reasons and saying today, okay, well, we need seismic uh, uh, assessment of this structure. And it's never been done, but if we're going to say now we're going to keep it for another 25 or 50 years, there are a lot of things that you have to go back through. And um, it happens not just with bridges. This one on the upper right, it's a, it's, it, it's a steel uh, fracture critical bridge that collapsed in Minneapolis. I also work on the investigation of that. And uh, it's a little bit of the same story. They, had in mind, it was built in the 60s, they had in mind a certain useful life, they, they built everything according to that, and then life goes on and you don't really want to replace the bridge unless you really have to. 
And uh, whether you have to or not, it is part of the condition assessment. So what our technology does specifically on pipeline is to go back to the, to the steel uh, pipeline and evaluate its remaining strength and toughness. Um, they built the pipeline not thinking about fracture toughness, not thinking about that one day it will crack, but 40, 50 years later, these structures have corrosion, they have cracks, and now they have to go back and evaluate the significance of that and what needs to be replaced, what can be repaired. Uh, so there's 300,000 miles of these high pressure transmission pipelines, and they're very important because uh, if you can think about how many uh, trucks you'll need across the country, because you can carry natural gas through trucks, it's just very, very expensive. So this is used for transmission of natural gas across states, uh, product, uh, liquid products, and crude as well. So it's a very big, uh, efficient industry because the, the cost of transmitting a gallon is very, very low. Now when it, when it breaks, um, then there's a lot of uh, consequences, not just for safety, but disruption of the system. In New England, 50% of what we use for electricity year round is made from natural gas. So if, if your family is big into electric cars and, and things like that that you charge, well, you still relying on, on fossil fuel for most of it. So it's just something to think about. Um, so one aspect here that uh, with respect to our technology is instead of having to do a cutouts here, here you have the transmission pipeline and uh, you build up that fitting. Uh, it looks like it's bolted. This one, most of them are welded on and then you can come and make a hot tap. So while the line is in service, you do drill a hole in it. And internally in this. And uh, it's very expensive. Even on a small line, you can't really make a hole for less than $50,000. And for $50,000, you get a little piece of metal this big. And so that's what you can bring to the lab and do some analysis. So interrupting the pipeline is, is very expensive. On bridges, it's not exactly as expensive. Although when you think of it, the areas of a bridge that you want to verify the strength and toughness are those that are heavily loaded. So the idea that you go there, do a cutout, and then try to repair it with welding, which we discussed a little bit and we're going to discuss more, is not easy. So it's a very difficult problem. Uh, if we're thinking like here on the storage drive, we have a tunnel that's essentially past its useful life, but there's 50,000 cars per day going through it. So the politician, who, who is going to take the ownership of shutting down Stowe Drive for three months to put a new tunnel? It's very, very difficult. It's extremely expensive. It's very disruptive. And uh, so those are examples of that fourth category um, that I mentioned about in terms of structural integrity, rehabilitation, that you do need to understand quite a bit about material to be able to do uh, work in those areas. Um, so more specifically about what we do, because this is something people sometimes ask me in the hallway. So we uh, do mechanical testing that is non-destructive, but essentially as accurate as what you'll do in the laboratory. So we went beyond the traditional hardness testing, uh, testing specifically for the yield strength, the ductility, and the fracture toughness. We have two tools. That's our first one. Uh, so it is portable. Uh, we're using it mo really mostly for pipeline, although we're starting to uh, test materials made by additive manufacturing, so structural repairs. They'll come and do a, a deposit on um, a helicopter blade that's been corroded or eroded, and then they want to evaluate, make sure that the properties obtained were good. So we're starting to do that as well. So it's, uh, it's very challenging. It's not really... Uh, the focus of the class to go over the details, but I, when, you, you, when you see me pour some example of uh, rehabilitation, it's because I've spent the past 10 years trying to keep certain things up. Uh, and um, hopefully that's helpful for background. Um, so that's what we concluded at the first lecture live here, that um, the, the, the engineering aspect of using structural material is 
at this point, in my perspective, a bigger challenge than developing the knowledge for these structural materials. There are a lot of things that we know from science today. We know exactly how corrosion takes place. We know exactly how fatigue takes place. Um, it, but <laughs> we have all these systems in place, and we want to build new structures. In, in Florida, they're going to want to build new bridges that are more resistant, more of this, or this, and this. And we, the, 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 the scientific knowledge, a lot of time is there, but it's a matter of how to apply it in the best way. And a lot of times it is to go back to examples um, from, from history. So this is how people have been building pressure vessels for 50 years. If you're going to build a pressure vessel, yes, go to the code, figure out exactly how to do it first. Don't think that you can outsmart 50 years of experience doing certain things. Now, when, if you do need to do something special, which happens more and more these days in terms of the efficiency and in terms of re repairing, uh, making a, a life extension. Um, it's, it's really where the, the knowledge challenge is in terms of knowing why the code was put a certain way. Uh, sometimes it is uh, because the committee is not perfectly balanced. There will be technical committees that are mostly manufacturers of uh, certain products. So when they get together and say, we're going to put a standard, they don't think of it the exact same way than if it's 10 people, there are three people from industry, three people from you know, homeowners <laughs> that ask questions or you know, city representatives. Uh, so it's very, very different. Uh, and right now, actually, uh, I attend these uh, public meetings for the regulation for the, the pressure pipelines. And it, it is a committee made that way where there's uh, a representative from the government, from the public, and the industry. And it's, it's very, very different if you, if you, than if you let all the industry people working it out together. So it's something to keep in mind when you look at a code, because in some, in some cases, then means the code will be balancing all these interests. In some cases, the code will be more organized, so easy, easy, to, easy to meet. If, if I'm making, I mean, it's, it's just normal nature. If I'm a manufacturer of pipes, I want a, a, a pipe building code that is safe, yes, but also that I know for sure that I'll meet all the requirements. That's, that's very important to me. So um, we are now back to <laughs> <laughs> the agenda of, of going to the how we make parts. And, I, and, I, and I'll take time at the end today to, for questions. Uh, that's something so you don't have to rush out. So we'll try to go through the material uh, and leave at least five, ten minutes for a question and answer. And I'll try to repeat the question so we don't have the problem with the video. Some people ask for a reference. So in terms of casting and solidification, like the fundamentals, that's a good one here. Um, Okay, uh, this is something we've talked a little bit. Um, we make castings because you can make complex shapes pretty quickly. Um, the main downside of doing this is um, the microstructure. So you make big pipes. Um, you can't control easily the microstructure of something that it's being cast. You can make some changes, and when I mentioned about um, making using pipes t today that are still casting ductile iron we call it's a small change in the, uh, t the the chemistry and the thermal treatment to make sure that it, the brittle face here is the black face so instead of having a very intricate pattern of a relatively uh, high hardness low ductility material you you cluster it in very, very small particle, and therefore you are able to have a deformable matrix. It's becoming a comp an effective composite, so you have a deformable matrix, and then you have the, the hard particles in it. So that's, that's, that's a way to get all the way from um, a liquid to a part at once. Um, I mentioned that um, the, the main justification for doing this, taking liquid metal and making a part, is cost. Um, as in terms of mechanical properties, most generally you want to work that cast microstructure to homogenize it, to improve the ductility, 
and, and tailor the mechanical properties to the, uh, to the application that you're looking for. So uh, this is the very brief overview, and we'll go over this, and how you make the rod product the bars that we can buy at a, at, at a, at a, at a metal yard. Um, they go through a continuous casting process. Um, so you take the metal and it goes through a mold and you'll see the mold here. So it's going down, it's getting chilled, it's getting solidified, or it's going through a, a casting process where it really goes from a liquid to a, to a, a solid and you try to do it quickly. Uh, it, when you're able to do it quickly, that's how you get a finer microstructure. Um, it is essentially um, this process that you use to make tin foils where uh, you have two rolls rolling next to each other. There's a relatively tiny space between them. And you keep pouring liquid into this pool here. So the rolls are cold and you start forming a little shell on each side here. And these, these two shells of metal squeeze together um, when, when you get to that point from here to here. And that's the strip that you form. So it's a strip caster. I'll give you some examples. That's something that I did work on uh, when I was younger. Um, there's a lot of variation. You can see this is when it's moving fast enough. The, the only thing that keeps the metal here is the fact that it's solidifying. So any variation in solidification rate here makes your process unstable. So there's, a, there's a lot of optimization taking place to make this happen. But it's, it's going quickly. So on a case like this, you have much less change in the chemistry through the thickness of the plate than in the more traditional process like this, where it's a very, very big cross section of that um, structure here. And then um, you, you're going to have the zone of relatively rapid solidification on the surface. And then you move into the core where it's solidifying more slowly. So on, on something like this, uh, if, if you're using it without doing this forging or deformation processing after the fact, you have, as you can see, a different microstructure through the location, even at between the corners and, and, and the, the center. Uh, you have a difference in chemistry. You have porosity. There's a lot of things for you to think about. Um, so we still do this, uh, this casting process, but these are some of the limitations associated with, with doing it. So why, why is it happening? OK, first of all, why? why we cast these structures that look so intricate, <laughs> right? When we had the, uh, I showed you the image of the cast iron. Why do we have to have all this black zone into it? Uh, by adding carbon to iron, you reduce the melting point significantly. And that's what you see in this phase diagram. So this is not meant to be overly complicated, but you can see with, um, on the left with 1550, uh, centigrade in terms of melting point and then if you add enough carbon so when you add around 4% carbon into the iron now you're at 1200. It may not look like a huge difference but in terms of the ability to make a mold to hold that uh, steel it's very different to try to cast something at 1550 degrees or plus uh, centigrade versus 1200. So the reason for this complex microstructure is adding the carbon to lower the melting point. So you can make the part more easily, you have less shrinkage. Uh, now, it's not, the, the cast iron has a lot of carbon, so it's not what we use uh, generally for a structure when we're talking about steel. We are in the, in the far left side here of the phase diagram, um, typically less than 0.5% carbon. So in the first little square there is where you have your steel. Um, so at that point, we do have to cast it at high temperature. And that's why traditionally steel's been used after developing the ability to, to, um, to use casting. So, uh, 
uh, cast iron. And um, in making steel, um, because of the solidification temperature and the, the mobility at that temperature, you will get very, uh, a lot of segregation. And that's what we see in those images I showed you of the ingot. Um, so this is another example with aluminum. On the aluminum alloy, it's, 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 a, it's a reduced difference. Uh, but you still see that you're starting at 660 centigrade for the melting point of pure aluminum to the, uh, to the left. And then at the eutectic, where you have about 10%, 10-12% silicon, you're below the 600 degree uh, mark. So it's lower temperature to have that alloy than trying to cast pure aluminum. It also gives you um, a stronger properties. Aluminum tend to be fairly soft, so adding silicon to it helps you with uh, that aspect. So, I mean, altogether, um, those are actually two very common uh, alloy series. So the, the, the cast iron for, for, for iron carbon and then the aluminum silicon for, for aluminum. Um, there are a lot of variation, but the, the, as far as the, uh, the main ingredients. So didn't want to go too deep into this. It's really detailed in the, in the reference. Um, but I did want to mention about how we, the, the free body diagram, or, uh, the, the phase diagram comes in. Um, it is essentially from uh, evaluating the energy of the different phase that you can have um, as you solidify. And um, essentially the, the system, so you have, you have aluminum, silicon, magnesium and, and a bunch of other elements. So that system starts as a liquid because in liquid everything is disorganized. You can have different concentration of everything you like. But when you start to solidify, these different uh, crystal structure are not going to accept the same amount of the different alloying elements. So that's really where you start having these different faces. We, we had the little dark face, we had the white face, there's all sorts of faces that uh, you can have. Um, it's, and it, it's, it's determined by lowering the overall free energy. So what, what the, you have in the example here, um, the upper right shows you the phase diagram and on the lower section you have a little bit of a schematic of the free energy curve for each face of the alloy. So the alpha here to the left has this steep uh, U-shape uh, at low concentration where you have a certain point where it's going to be a low overall energy. So it's actually, it, it reduces the free energy to add a little bit of alloying elements. So that's why that curve goes here and it's, it's going down first and then it's going way, way, way back up. So there is a limit of that alpha, uh, in that alpha phase and how much alloying element you're going to take. The liquid line is, is a little bit more smooth and it's going to continue on each side. And then you have the other phase here that has the same steep behavior where if you add a little bit, you reduce your energy and then you increase your energy again. So the way the, the diagram works for these three phases is, is looking at, okay, if I have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, then my overall free energy is over here, so it, you reduce that free energy. That's something that from the thermodynamic, the system tends to lower its free energy, and that's really the reason why you're forming two phases in a nutshell. You can take a whole thermodynamic class on this, but we'll try to avoid that. Um, so this is how it looks um, as in certain time, it's, this is an idealized case where you can solidify very, very uh, slowly, where uh, the reason for having a very, very intricate shape is as you solidify, when you form a little bit of a protrusion on your solidification front, what happens is uh, you're able to push the alloying element that you don't want in your system to each side here. So that means that um, 
you, you essentially reduce the melting point in these two regions. And the, the only one area that doesn't have a reduced melting point is what's in front of you. So you just keep going as, as, as fast as you can. And, and you don't have a stable certification front. So it's the action of expelling the, the alloying elements that allow you to um, kinematically form this uh, dendrite structure that is a big reason for variation in properties in these castings. Um, now, <laughs> more simply put, as far as how we do these things, we do need a mold to cast. And depending on, um, of course, how the mold is made, you can have a metal mold. So if you have a metal mold here, you don't need, you don't have a whole lot of time for this process to take place to move away the, uh, the solid atoms. So you're able to form a more homogeneous material right away than if you're cooling slowly. The first case we're looking at is, is cooling relatively slowly where uh, you make a non-metallic mold. Uh, sand casting is that big fitting we looked at. Uh, it's used quite a bit because of low cost. You don't need tremendous volume. You, see, you make these, these molds and then you use them uh, over and over again. Um, you have the two sides, so you're limited to geometries where you, you have to be able to demold it, um, which is a little bit of a limitation sometimes. Um, investment casting, we mentioned it a little bit on Friday. Um, you make all the shapes that you're interested in into a wax pattern that you can dip into a slurry to make that mold that you're looking for. Uh, when, as you center that mold to make it a strong shell, you, you lose the wax inside. So now you have a cavity that you can use for casting. So you can make very complex geometry because the, process, the final process is to break that mold. You, you can't demold it. Um, it's used for complex geometries uh, with titanium uh, castings. Titanium is very hard to machine. So um, in the aerospace, they've been trying for years and years to use more uh, titanium castings because you can make the very complex shapes that require just a little extra machining at the end without having to start from a very big, expensive slab of, or, or plate of the titanium alloy that you have to machine off 80% or 90% of it to make your part. Um, so the, the, the lost wax casting could look like it's old school by the name of it, but it's still uh, used quite a bit today. They also call it investment casting because you invest into the mold, you completely destroy it each time. The one thing you can do if you're making a series is to make a mold for making the wax pattern and that you can reuse over and over again. And then what they do here also is uh, they will be uh, uh, welding essentially small pieces of, of, of that uh, wax into other pieces of wax to, to, make, it, to make the assemblies that they're looking for. Um, a lot of times in, in this, uh, in this um, investment casting, um, you want to control the environment to avoid the, uh, the oxidation. Because if you can, you want to make the final parts. And one of the limitation factors in there is your mold. So if your mold is still pr producing uh, moisture, for example, that will you know, have a very detrimental effect on the quality of the product that you get out of this. So as a contrasting example, uh, the die casting is um, made out of all of metals. And um, so you, ha you feed into your mold um, the liquid metals, and you let it solidify. And I did bring an example because it's not intuitive. I think that when you actually see it, it's useful. 
No, not working. Oh, great. I knew this was a risk here, but decided to do it anyway. Closing the mold. There's a cooling system into each of the metal modes. So it stays there for about 20, 30 seconds. And here you are. Now you got, you got some flashing, you got things to remove, but you, you're making a relatively complex shape at a high production rate. And then uh, you have to clean up that mold, make sure that you don't have anything left in it. Um, you make a lot of injection molded Plastics are made the same way, essentially. So this is a, a fast speed process. It requires quite a bit of tooling. Everything here looks like it's old and dirty, but uh, it's, it's still very expensive to make in terms of the alloy and having those cooling systems at the proper location. So you have a big upfront investment if you're gonna make one of those parts, but then making a bunch of them. It's not, it's not a problem. Okay. So, some variation of that um, is a process where you able to cast into this uh, mold here a um, semi-solidified metal, like you have aluminum that already has solid pieces in it. And that is really a way to make the properties homogeneous. Because you, are, you, you already set where you want the, uh, the, the crystals to grow. You, so you're not allowing for this process of starting from the metal surface and, and going in. It's just going in all direction. Um, it's more expensive to prepare that feedstock and to control the system, so it's really not used a whole lot today. So, um, in terms of castings, we, we really went quickly through the concepts of certification. I mean, certification happens for reduction in the free energy. You're going to go into a single phase or multiple phases, depending on the alloying elements that you have. Uh, one reason for adding uh, alloying elements is to reduce the melting point. That's, that's where cast iron comes from. And also the aluminum silicon. Uh, and those make a relatively intricate structure that has good wear resistance, got multiple uh, uh, faces into it. But as cast, it has generally low fracture toughness, low ductility. And that's why we are going to talk more about uh, the deformation processing. Now, when we say low ductility, low toughness, a lot of that was related to those dendrites. And I think you'll remember, it's a little bit like uh, forming ice flakes or uh, just a little bit of a, a, a ice layer on a, on a window. It starts one place and then it goes and you all these intrinsic place because of pushing back all the impurities uh, to locations you don't uh, that becomes less uh, able to solidify. So again, he is, the melting point is reducing, so therefore it's not going to solidify, it's going to solidify up front. So that's a way, hopefully, to remember it. Um, when we went into the example sand casting versus die casting, the big advantage you have when you're able to use metal modes is you solidify a lot quicker, so you get rid of these um, issues of certification. So let's go. Let's talk about castings or anything else that you want to cover over the first two classes. This is the opportunity. I know it's Monday morning. So I'm going to have to help you guys.
think of examples of products that wouldn't be good for casting Okay, so the question was examples of things you, we don't want to use for casting. And um, let's take the extreme first: a landing gear for an aircraft. Uh, you you can't have that break. The worst case scenario is it will bend. Okay, it'll be giving a little bit. Uh, you still don't want that, but let's say like you're really in an extreme condition, and this is a one in a lifetime landing. You, don't, you just don't want it to break. If it bends, it actually can be an extra suspension, okay? So you make the design in a way that it's using all material, all the connections, will never really just fracture. And, 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 and you have a lot of that in automotive as well. So an uh, automotive, if, something, if you overload an, a frame of a pickup truck, you'll see it sags, <laughs> but it doesn't fracture in two pieces. So, I mean, those are, t are two extreme examples. Um, I don't know, what, what do you want to build that, uh, that you allow to break? This chair, every, one, every once in a while, it will, you know, eventually, it could break. But even so, the, the way they make the plastic chairs now is it will, it will fold at some point, but it's not really going to break. So there's, there's a lot of failed before break involved in a, in a lot of structure. So on, a, on a, a steel pipe, the steel pipe example that we do use casting, you have to make it into this special face that, that, is, that still has enough ductility because even for those pipes, you don't want them to really just fracture all at once. So the cases that you're willing to uh, have a, a brittle fracture, I mean, you have the kid's toy, right? All of them. You, they, they can crack all at once and that's okay. You, you have uh, ornaments, all sorts of things like that that are a perfect example where it's okay to uh, have a low ductility behavior. But for a lot of structural application, you do want that ductility and that's why we don't use castings. Yeah? Can you just make them, like in non-weight critical applications, you can just beef them up so that they're a little bit, you know, they you, don't ever get to a place where you need the ductility. Exactly. Loading. Exactly. Yes. So the the, uh, the the we're still the topic is still when you have um, an application that you'd be willing to compromise on the mechanical property and make it a little bigger uh, is where you have you know all the little fixtures and cars, the handles and all these things that. You don't, it's not good for the reputation <laughs> when things break. So you make them a little stronger, you make them out of aluminum, so it's lightweight still. Uh, but it's not the end of the world, it's not, it's not critical uh, structurally. Uh, so those are, those are good examples and you can use spotted metallurgy, you can use all sorts of ways to make, um, I guess, secondary structural application. So even in aircrafts, you'll have castings for the little tray that you pull out, things like that. that if, if, if that, in terms of overall cost, is, is the way to go, it's just when it comes to the mainframe that is much less risk you can take. Yes? Um, going back to your work with MMT, um, so I take it like, you know, back in the 60s or before, there was, in general, less material control. Um, and, and what things mm -hmm. are built of are not the same specs that we would use today. How do you compensate when really the best answer may be to just kind of try again? Um, with okay. Fresh <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question was how to, to, how to go back in terms of structural integrity to the pipelines that I've talked about. There is a very, um, it's, it, this is interesting because every year I'll be able to say more about this. Over the past year, what we've done is uh, spoken to a lot of people that run inline inspection tools. So what they can do with those inspection tools is identify for two miles that it's, it's, it's steel made from the same mill, the exact same specification. If it turns out that two miles go through Brooklyn, New York, you really want to know. So if you know that over 10 miles going through Brooklyn, New York, you have three or four different batches of steel, then you go to these three or four, establish your properties, and you know for the entire line, 
you may say, I got to replace this two, three miles, but the remaining six miles, okay. You may say, everything needs to go, which a lot of times means digging and removing other utilities. So if you got to take the gas line out, maybe the water line is too close or above it, and electrical, <laughs> the circulation system, I mean, it's, 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 it's incre incredible. The, the complexity involved, and that's the reason why not start from the beginning. Um, there is an example of pipeline of starting from the, uh, the beginning, National Grid on Cape Cod replaced for 50 miles of pipelines at $1.2, $1 $1.5 million a mile. So $50 million just because they didn't feel comfortable continuing operate the old pipeline. But the reason why the cost per mile wasn't too high is it's open space. So they didn't have the to deal with uh, crossing with other utilities as much as you'll have in almost every other location, really. I mean, Cape Cod, everything has to go around. And the city, things will just go one way, the other way. And uh, especially if we, take, if we take of our roads in the Boston area, we can't think that the, everything that's on the ground is made in a better <laughs> pattern than that. So, it's, so there's, there's a big incentive not to just say, oh, this is too complicated. I'd rather have a new system. At 300,000 miles, um, at say $2 million a mile, it, it, you just can't do this. Now it's becoming like the budget for the US. So you, you have to go one step at a time. Um, now in terms of um, even prioritizing there, there's a lot of things that will come from history. So they'll know certain types of pipes made in a certain range of years have been rupturing more than others. And that's an area of, 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 of focus. Um, and, if this, and you establish your priorities from there. Things that you don't know about, but have not been a problem at all. You, have to, you still have good faith in it. But some of the things that happened recently is uh, longitudinal seams. So the pipes are made from flat products and roll. So you have a weld all along the length that's in the hoop stress direction. So intuitively, that means like, yeah, you, this, this is the, a critical location. It doesn't mean all pipes break there because a lot of pipes will end, end up breaking because they were dented. And that doesn't mean somebody coming with a backhoe to hit them, just the, the back fill from the time it was done, sometimes we'll put rocks at, the, at a bad spot just right under the pipeline so it settles and creates a dent that will now start to, to cycle and make a crack. You also, I think you're the one who mentioned about stress corrosion. So a lot of these pipes will, if it's big diameter, let's say it's a pipe this big, it will become a little bit um, compressed by, by the soil in, in a certain condition. So if you compress that cylinder, now you have a, a tension on the outside on each side. So typically that's not where the seam is, but that's where you can have cracks as well. So in those pipes you say, I need to know the base material properties. In other cases, you want the well properties. And, um, what the pipeline industry does with this is they essentially establish uh, and a, a different assessment for different threats. So if I'm worried about having stress corrosion cracking on my system because the strength level, um, for example, and uh, maybe how I'm doing my, cor my corrosion protection, um, then I'm, I need to think about toughness of the base material for when, because there's no if, <laughs> when I have a crack, is it going to be a small leak or is it going to be a rupture? That's what they worry about. It's a, avoiding big ruptures is, is very important for safety, for reputation, and uh, for continuing to be able to operate the pipeline. Not easy. It's reality. That's why uh, you know this. This is going to be a big topic for this class. Where, yes, you can uh, you can design certain things. Things like oh, I'm going to. One example, and this doesn't come up as much anymore because I use it as an example. <laughs> but um, at people with a student project, they want say you want to build. You, let's say you have to build a cylinder 
vessel. And the, you know, you always, if you're doing a, a, a geometrical design, I mean, this could be almost anything. But let's say I'm trying to build this. The first order priority, in my mind, is not the strength of the material you're going to use, but how you're going to make that cap. If you make a square cap, you have very, very high stresses because when you start pressurizing it, it's going to try to open up in those corners, and, that, and that's a big problem. So instead, you do want a rounded cap, and you'll, you'll see that a lot in, um, in, in, in different cylinders that are being made. But even then, think about this. It's not made out of a single piece. So if you go to the uh, material selection guide, they say, oh, I can get this, it's not a spring steel, it has enough ductility, 5% is good for me. Uh, that may be true, but then how are you gonna make that shape if it involves welding? Now you're looking at the wrong chart. You have to look at uh, welded properties for your strength evaluation. So <laughs> it's just, it, it just comes back all together here. It's, you, you'd like to think things, well, I'll just use the chart. It works a lot in aerospace when we discuss it because you have to use rot products. They have these very established properties. So to some extent, the role of a material scientist in the general operation is reduced because it's all homogeneous materials. It's all made sort of the same way, so you can compare them more easily. In the reality of a complex structure, a lot of times it's more complex. Any other thoughts? You, you, you. Um, you said that you take out samples from bridges and uh, you know, pipelines, and then how do you weld it back and ensure that, you know, uh, you said you will value it, I mean, elaborate more on that. Okay, like okay. Pipeline. Okay, as far as removing samples um, from bridges, most of the time it's done at a non-critical location, so you can Put, put, a, put a patch, just weld, weld install a patch after the fact in a way that you don't, you, you transfer the load by shear. It's, it's a little complex, it's not, it's not fun to have to put these on. And that's why they try to minimize the amount of material they remove. For the pipelines, um, most of the time they can't stop the service. Um, it's cost, but also how the system is set up where you have all these pumps, you have all these things going, and it's going, and it's going, and it's going, and the idea to just stop this is actually a, a high risk because now all of a sudden you're creating a big pressure cycle that you don't have otherwise. So it's in service, and that was one of the, the first image. It's a big one. I should, I should get you a smaller one. But let's assume that you put that assembly here, so it's a, it's a valve that you go and you weld on the pipeline. Um, when you're done, can't take it out. So now all of a sudden you remove your tool, you take your sample, and you put a blind flange. It's, it's, there's actually, there's a ball valve in there, there's a gate valve, this is a gate valve. So you, 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 you have a, a, a little bit of a, a cost associated with this new stuff that you're putting on the pipeline that's gonna stay there. Um, if you wanna create a new line from it though, that's good because now all of a sudden you have your fitting and you could, you could shut the system and, that's, and it happens quite a bit. So if they, have, if they have a small section that they need to take out a service permanently, they'll end up doing these things a lot of times because, of, because they can't shut it down. So it's a way to divert a pipeline without ever stopping it. Uh, aircrafts, you put them to the ground, so that's, 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 that's good and nice. I don't know, um, ships, you take them out of service as well. So it's, it's not that many things, but I, thankfully enough for our company, it's, it is enough of those that uh, just, just this one application where you, you need to continue carry the product or it's, it's pretty, they don't even consider it actually shutting it down unless the, uh, the, let's say it's going to a refinery that has a schedule shut down, then that's your one time opportunity to do something, but it's 48 hours or something like that, that's the time you have. We have one of those coming up where 
they will have enough time to remove one section. And then the other one, we're going to just do the assessment to see if it's similar to the, to the one that's been removed, essentially. So that's it. That's cool. Yes? Um, for like the destructive material tests, um, I've only done like them on, on coupons that are about you know this big. Uh, what's the minimum size of coupon that you need to get a good assessment? Okay, a question on, on testing uh, coupons for strain. It depends. If For tensile, you can make very small tensiles. Uh, the standard will still be two to four inches, depending which ASTM, if it's aluminum or steel. But in the lab, you can make a smaller one. The challenge is for toughness. For toughness, you need a certain thickness, and you need a certain size, and that's... That's typically just enough when you do a core this big, you're able to do those tests. But it's, it's a process of getting that piece of metal. So it's inches. All right, guys, we'll take it from here next time. Thank you.